Welcome to the Emergency Medicine Cases Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Anton Hellman, bringing you Canada's brightest minds in emergency medicine from EMC Studios in Toronto. All right, welcome back, Dr. Summer, Dr. Tillman, and Dr. Bamel, to this part two of our series on DKA and HHS. This part two is dedicated to HHS. So let's just jump straight into a case. A 77-year-old man arrives with his wife via EMS. He appears lethargic. His wife says that over the past eight days, he's become increasingly weak, stopped walking, and this morning would not talk to her. His vital signs are normal, except for a blood pressure of 90 on 62 and a pulse of 115 beats per minute. A cap glucose reads high, and his venous pH is 7.37. Not too bad. We talked about how DKA can mimic or be triggered by an acute abdomen in part one of the series on DKA HHS. Similarly, HHS can be triggered by or confused with a primary neurologic problem. So Dr. Bamel, how do we sort this out? Yeah, so I would start with a healthy amount of respect for the elderly patient that is hyperglycemic and altered. Uh, The in-hospital mortality in Ontario is reported as 16% for patients like this one. And again, it's hard to know from the outset, is it all metabolic or is there something else that's contributing to his unwellness? For example, an acute neurological event like a stroke or sepsis. So in this patient, I would keep my workup quite broad. I would start with serum ketones or urinary ketones and serum osmols to see if there's coexisting DKA. 20 to 30% of these patients can also have DKA. I would send for urine and blood cultures as well as a chest x-ray to look for signs of an occult infection. And I would have a low threshold for starting antibiotics in this patient. I would also do a cardiogram and possibly neuroimaging. I think it would be reasonable to wait to do neuroimaging until you've resuscitated the patient a little bit and see if their sensorium improves, especially if you're working in a setting that does not have easy access to imaging. Uh, But either way, as long as it's being considered, I think that's uh, the important piece, assuming that the patient does not have any focal neurodeficits or any signs of trauma. All right. So this story sounds a bit more like HHS than DKA. And that'll become clear why in a moment. Dr. Summer, can you review for us the presentation of HHS and how it differs from that of DKA? These diseases can sometimes present on a spectrum, but in general, they're fairly different. The HHS patients in general will be more elderly. They will be type 2 rather than type 1 diabetics, but not always. And in contrast to DKA, which tends to be of more abrupt and acute onset, HHS patients usually have a more protracted, indolent course of disease where they're getting worse over the course of several days or even sometimes weeks. And that also plays into the actual illness itself. Both of those diseases, both HHS and DK, will have huge fluid deficits, and part of it will be the osmotic diuresis, and part of it, because HHS patients tend to get sick slowly, will also be from poor intake. Now, there are criteria. A couple of societies have uh, posted criteria for diagnosis of HHS, and really, most of it is they have to be hyperglycemic, usually blood glucose greater than 30. They have to be hyperosmolar with serum osmolality of greater than 320. And in contrast to DKA, they should have low or no circulating ketones, a near physiologic pH with a pH of 7.3 or more, a near physiologic bicarb levels with levels of 15 or greater, and on top of that, altered mental status. So hyperglycemia, hyperosmolarity, altered mental status, and none of those DKA criteria. All right, so just to review there, we're talking high glucose, high osmolarity, low or no ketones, normal or near-normal VBG, and they're almost always altered. There's always a neurologic component going on. And knowing that there is some overlap between DKA and HHS, so they can have both. And again, on average, the patients are older, 
and type 2 diabetics. That being said, there are young patients that present in HHS, although rare. It's definitely been well described in the literature, even in a pediatric population. And there are type 2 diabetics that present in DKA. So just because they don't fit the mold doesn't mean they don't have the disease. It's important, I think, to understand a bit about the pathophys of HHS compared to DKA. So that'll help to dictate how we're going to be treating these patients slightly differently. Um, Dr. Tillman, how does the practical pathophysiology differ between DKA and HHS? And in particular, why are the fluid losses so much more pronounced, generally speaking, in HHS? Sure. So when thinking about the pathophysiology, I think about it fairly simply, and it all has to do with the degree of insulin deficiency and or resistance. So in both these disease states, HHS or DKA, there is some insulin insufficiency or resistance that has impaired the normal utilization of glucose. And as we talked about in the last episode, the high levels of glucose lead to osmotic diuresis. Now, when we think about DKA, there is an absolute insulin deficiency and resistance, which means that the body is not able to respond to insulin. Therefore, to meet the baseline metabolic needs, the body has to switch into ketosis. Therefore, you start breaking down fatty acids, developing ketone bodies, and become acidotic. This is a process that the body can't tolerate for an extended period of time, and they present usually sooner to the emergency department with those characteristics we talked about, the abdominal pain, the vomiting, the acidosis, all the metabolic abnormalities. Conversely, when we think of HHS, this is a relative insulin resistance or deficiency. So they still respond a bit to insulin. What this means is they can meet some of their baseline metabolic demands and their body doesn't have to switch into ketosis. So they're not breaking down fatty acids and they're not generating ketone bodies. Therefore, they're not becoming acidotic. This allows the process to go on for a longer period of time because there's not an acute change. And as their glucose levels increase, that's going to lead to further diuresis. And that underlying phenomenon is going to lead to them being hyperosmolar, which is going to lead to confusion, which is going to lead to decreased fluid intake, which is going to worsen the situation. So they have more time to lose fluid, and they also become confused and take in less fluids. So that's why traditionally when an HHS patient presents, It's taken more time for them to present, and they are far more dehydrated. Likewise, because they have more time, their glucose levels can get much higher in their body as well. All right. So as we were saying in part one of the podcast on DKA, the diagnostic criteria of DKA are actually not that clear. What about for HHS? So we know that you need a high glucose, uh, high osmolarity, and that the ketones can be normal and the VBG can be normal. The patient is usually altered. What are the actual diagnostic criteria that we can say, okay, for sure this patient has HHS? I think it's very simple. It's hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic state. So the definition states that the glucose should be over 33.3 to be exact, and that the osmols should be over 320. Usually the patient will be altered, but not necessarily in a comatose state. That's why I think they changed the lingo from honk, which was hyperosmolar, hyperglycemic, non-ketotic coma, uh, to HHS. Also to keep us all on our toes so that we sound like we're up to date when we're talking to our learners. All right. And we had talked about some of the triggers for DKA, like not taking their insulin, steroids, infection, MI, stroke. Are they the same kind of triggers for HHS or uh, are there kind of particular triggers that are more common in HHS? So I would say that most of your triggers are quite similar. When someone presents with an acute diabetic complication, it's quite often related to issues with access or utilization of their medications. When we think of HHS, this also gets worsened by an inability to replace the fluid losses as well. So when we think of our older patients, they have impaired mobility. Uh, If they're in situations where they don't have access to water, it can worsen this as well. But really, the initial inciting event is quite similar between the two different disease states. You want to have an understanding of the patient you're looking at, because if you're looking at a 70-year-old male 
the initial diseases they're at risk for are different than a 30-year-old. But it's thinking of it that way as opposed to their specific disease related to HHS. I think when I was reading about this, one of the things that I found interesting and surprising was that the mortality of HHS is so much higher than that of DKA. We think of our DKA patients as being some of the sickest patients in our department. They're tachypnic. They often have severe tachycardia. They look really bad. Whereas the HHS patient looks like an obtunded elderly patient in general, not that dissimilar from our other delirious patients, their mortality is actually much higher than the DKA patient. And so we have to be aware of that. And some of that mortality is because, yeah, they're elderly, so their mortality is inherently higher. But some of that mortality is also because of that underlying cause that is often not initially diagnosed, not that that would necessarily make a difference in their course, but they usually do have a significant underlying diagnosis. So HHS, uh, we've got some slightly different metabolic parameters, slightly different pathophys. The mortality is higher than DKA. We really, like DKA, have to look out for that underlying cause because, again, that's going to be the thing that kills them. Let's now move on to the treatment and see if it's much different than the treatment in DKA. And in the treatment, we'll talk again about the goals of treatment. So we talked about the goals of treatment for DKA. What are the goals of treatment for HHS? So I think this is one of the main areas where DKA and HHS slightly differ. So if you remember from the last podcast, I talked about how you're really trying to fix the acidosis. You're trying to close the anion gap. And that's what we're looking at as one of the goals in DKA. In HHS, we're saying there's not a ketotic state and not an acidosis. That goal is no longer there. Instead, the comatose or the stupor state is related to their hyperosmolarity, and that's what we're trying to correct. But that is very similar to the start of DKA as well. So the first goal is replace their fluid losses. The second goal is then to correct their metabolic disturbances, which is both their hypernatremia and again, their hypokalemia. The last goal is to fix their hyperglycemia, but that's sort of a representation of getting them back to their normal metabolic utilization of carbohydrates, more so than we just need the glucose to look good. The glucose should come down because by replacing their insulin, by resuscitating the patient, we've allowed them to return to a normal metabolic state. All right, so again, the goals are Correction of volume deficits. We want to normalize the hyperosmolality. We want to fix the K and we want to correct the hyperglycemia. And now, a word from our sponsor, Metricade, the experts on scheduling systems. Since 2015, I've been using Metricade, the incredible self scheduling system that has made my life and the lives of my colleagues so much easier. I get the schedule I want, hassle free. And the efficiency of the ED improves because they're using these amazing algorithms based on each individual doc's efficiency. Very cool. Let them give you a hand. Check out metricade.com slash emcases and get in touch with them today. Let's break down the treatment of HHS into fluids, electrolytes, and insulin with the goals in mind of correcting the volume deficits and the hyperosmolality and the hyperglycemia. So let's start with the fluids. Dr. Bamel, we know that HHS patients tend to be drier than DKA patients. Can you tell us a bit about how we should adapt our fluid resuscitation for HHS? So there are no studies that I'm aware of that guide the optimal treatment for HHS. Most of the guidelines, UK, Canadian, American guidelines, recommend pretty much the same fluid resuscitation as you would for a DKA patient. So you're starting again with a liter of normal saline over an hour or ringers, uh, depending on what's easily available and accessible. And then you're moving on to a maintenance rate of 250 to 500 cc's an hour, depending on the patient's volume status and their underlying comorbidities. Again, I would make a plug here for using point-of-care ultrasound. Not all elderly patients can't receive aggressive fluid management, and not all young patients can receive aggressive fluid management. So it's helpful to just take a look at the heart and the IVC and see what's going on, and that can really help see what your patient's fluid tolerance is. 
You're looking to decrease the glucose by about three to four millimoles per hour and the osmoles by about three osmoles per hour. And just like in DKA, you're going to be adding some potassium to your maintenance fluids because they are potassium deplete from the osmotic diuresis from the hyperglycemia. And if you're further on in the treatment, if your glucose drops, then certainly you can supplement them with glucose depending on whether you're using insulin as well. Okay. And then usually you're adding the glucose when... When the glucose reaches about 14. 14 or so. Okay. And that, that would be about 300 milligrams per deciliter in the U.S. All right. I want to get a little bit deeper into the electrolytes and potassium is the big one here. So in HHS, how do we go about correcting the potassium? So again, your potassium is going to look good on your lab values, but they're usually potassium deplete. And this is because of hemoconcentration. So if the potassium is normal or low, you're going to add 20 to 40 millimoles of KCL to each liter of saline that you're infusing. And so you're placing them at about 10 to 20 milliequivalents per hour of potassium. Your maintenance solution can be half normal saline if the corrected sodium is high or normal. And I'll just make a plug for if the patient is significantly stuporous and you're going to be adding potassium, put in a Foley catheter because you want to ensure that the patient has reasonable urine output to ensure that you're not going to cause hyperkalemia. For sure. Yes. The patient has to be urinating. That's a very good point for you to replace the potassium. So hopefully they've had some urine output with your first liter when you're on to your maintenance fluids. Absolutely. So we've covered fluids and lights in the treatment of HHS. Next up is insulin. Dr. Tillman, what is the role of insulin besides just lowering the number to make us feel good? When we think of treating HHS, we are not really focused on the gap and insulin falls to the back of our mind. And yes, aggressive fluid resuscitation or appropriate fluid resuscitation is going to drive down the glucose. It's going to help it shift intercellular concentrations change but it's not going to help your body start to use the glucose or overcome your relative or absolute deficiency. So aside from making the number look better, it actually is what allows the body to start using that extra insulin. So in many situations where a patient with HHS comes to me in the ICU, they're going to be started on insulin infusion to help them start getting back to metabolic homeostasis. Are we as rigorous saying it must be an insulin infusion versus subcutaneous insulin? Because we're not trying to carefully close this gap, and many of these patients are going to normalize their glucose or bring it closer to normal with aggressive fluid resuscitation, we can also use subcutaneous insulin in this patient population as well. But the key thing is a lot of this state was driven by the fact that they were not appropriately using their glucose because they were resistant to whatever insulin they had in their body or had a deficient amount of insulin. And therefore, we must replace the insulin, not just to make the number look better, but to restart metabolic homeostasis. So I really like what Burke said, which was that we need to give appropriate fluid to these patients. It took a long time for them to get there, so it's going to take a long time to correct them. But how much fluid we give is not so much dependent on the age of the patient and their frailty, it's how much they can tolerate. And we don't want to under-resuscitate these patients. It's really a case-by-case basis. These are sort of averages to think about, 250 to 500 cc's an hour of maintenance fluid following a liter bolus, but it certainly will help to do frequent volume checks and using bedside ultrasound to see what their fluid status is at various points in their treatment process. In terms of how to actually give the insulin, we talked on the last podcast about, generally speaking, not giving an insulin bolus and starting an insulin infusion at 0.1 units per kilogram per hour. Is there anything different in HHS compared to DKA in terms of how you give the insulin? No, and I don't think there are any guidelines to help us that I came across anyway. You could give a little bit less, like 0.05 units per kilo per hour if you chose to do it intravenously. But you could also do, as Burke said, you can give their normal subcutaneous insulin long-acting injection as well. So the bottom line really with HHS is that the emphasis should be more on the fluids than on the insulin, as opposed to... In DKA, you really have to be carefully titrating the insulin because they're completely insulin depleted. Correct. 
learned all the practical nuggets of wisdom about DKA and HHS that'll arm you with the tools that you need to take care of these patients in the emergency department. That leaves us with the question of what's going to happen in the future in terms of management of these patients. So let's try and put our horoscopes on and, uh, <laughs> and try and predict how the management of these patients might change, say, in five years or 10 years or 15 years. Let's start with you, Dr. Bamel. I'd like to see ketone measurements and the technology for ketone measurements come as far as glucose measurement has come. So nowadays, people can wear glucose monitor that continuously monitors their sugars and they can check it on their phone, which is incredible. And it saves them a lot of finger pokes and allows them to get better control. For ketone measurements, my understanding is there are some ketone meter available, but they're not ubiquitous. And it would be great for patients to also be able to measure their ketones so they can see when they're, they've got ketonemia before they become ketoacidotic. The other thing that would be really nice to have in all our emergency departments would be able to measure beta-hydroxybutyrate levels. So we're not concerned about false negatives and we, you know, we don't have to worry so much about where the gap is coming from. Is it just the lactate or is there something else going on there? So it would save us a lot of time if we had a beta-hydroxybutyrate level that would come back not within two days, but within an hour or two. And along similar lines, I know that in the UK, there is actually a point of care beta-hydroxybutyrate test that is not widely available in Canada. So similar to just having a urine ketone strip, this is something that could be done at the bedside, would give a result very quickly and absolutely guide treatment. And it would be wonderful to have that available widespread in Canada. So two other areas where I think there may be some evolution in the management of DKA. The first is we talked a bit about the utilization of subcutaneous insulin, and we're seeing this studied more and more. So I would not be surprised if there starts to be more protocols that are using more subcutaneous insulin to try and limit the resource utilization, although acknowledging the close monitoring these patients need. I would expect to see some more advancement in utilization of subcutaneous therapies. The other area probably further off that I see coming to the ICU, is a much more closed-loop system. So as Mel was saying, people can have instantaneous feedback on their glucose. I expect that there'll be systems in which there can be ongoing monitoring of both the glucose, the anion gap, the potassium, so that as we're resuscitating the patients, the infusions they get will be able to be automated based on fairly real-time values, thinking much like the two-bag drip we talked about earlier, as opposed to having these slow turnarounds where you send the blood work every two to four hours, it comes back half an hour to an hour later than you're reacting to the past. The timeline of this, I have no idea. I'm not an engineer and don't pretend to be one. I just like sci-fi. But given the advancements in technology we've seen over the past decade alone, I would be unsurprised to see a lot more real-time feedback for what our therapies are doing. One last thing I'd like to add, and modern medicine has been treating DKA for you know over a century at this point. Chris Small described it in the late 1800s. The one thing that won't go away is diabetes and the fact that it affects primarily marginalized populations. And those are the ones that primarily will end up in the emergency department acutely ill. And so in the future, ideally, we'd have a way to actively treat these patients not only for their biochemical issues, but also their social issues that would help prevent them from getting as sick in the future. And so having easy access to both diabetes instruction, but also diabetes-specific social work and programs that can help those patients on a longitudinal basis is really where the future is here. Beautiful. Well, thanks so much, guys. That was uh, enlightening. I have to admit that my brain sometimes hurts when I'm trying to figure out the VBG that I get back on a patient and whether they actually have DKA or not. And trying to search for the underlying cause is sometimes a challenge, and this has made it a lot easier. So I'm kind of looking forward to the next DKA patient that I see. Thanks for being on EM Cases. Thanks for having us. Always a pleasure. Thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for bringing me in. For those of you who primarily listen to the podcast, don't forget that the EM Cases website is packed with goodies. We've got Rob Samard's Pocus Cases videos if you want to brush up on your Pocus skills. 
We've got Jesse McLaren's ECG cases to sharpen your ECG reading skills and get up to date on stuff like Occlusion MI. We've got all the show notes on one page under the summaries heading and the rapid reviews videos of many of the main episodes if you prefer video reviews. We've got the Crit Cases blog with Stars Air Ambulance and Mike Mish. The Waiting to be Seen blog, if you have if you have any interest in admin related to EM, Howard Ovens is your man. The huge quiz vault to test your knowledge of the main episode podcast. We've got ebooks on PEDS EM and MSK emergencies. And last but not least, we have the sign up for the Just for Nuggets emails as well as the QA Pearl of the Week emails. Please do cruise on over to the EM Cases website and see what our buffet of EM goodies has to offer you. And until next time, take it easy. Mm-hmm.